percent will experience life threatening. We're talking about uh, uh, individuals that are going through withdrawals. Alcohol withdrawals t tend to be the worst. And we're going to find out why in just a second. These are the things that happen to you. Five to fifty percent will uh, will have major symptoms. Tachycardia is, is rapid heartbeat. Tachy tach, you know, tachometer is a measures your speed. Well, tach, tach, tachycardia is uh, rapid heartbeat. Uh, transient uh, tactile auditory or visual hallucinations and illusions. This is really kind of weird. Uh, these are the pink elephants that people talk about, except they're crawling out of your skin. Uh, and they're not elephants. They're usually bugs or snakes or something horrible. Um, psychomotor agitation, uh, grand mal seizures. Grand mal seizures, these are epileptic seizures we're talking about. The person goes into seizures, and this is usually what kills them. And then delirium tremens, and delirium tremens have to do with... Tr with with uh, tremors and it has to do with the hallucinations and illusions that we're talking about. Um, it gets really interesting. We're going to talk about that in just a second. Uh, for individuals going through alcohol withdrawals, delirium, tremens, and seizures are the most severe and life-threatening uh, effects. Uh, once upon a time, and that this once upon a time wasn't that long ago, before World War II, uh, people that were trying to withdraw from alcohol, 35% of them died. 35% died. That means one out of every three people who tried to get off of alcohol died of either seizures or delirium tremens. Sometimes they became psychotic and they were no longer functional as humans. Uh, with modern techniques, of course, the mortality rate still approaches 5 to 15 percent, and if left untreated, the, the rates increase 10 to 20 percent. So people going cold turkey, I'm going to fix myself, 10 to 20 percent of them die from the withdrawal symptoms. And these are usually the, the seizures. They'll, they'll go into a seizure and then they'll choke to death. Uh, and this is just the way it works. Alcohol, heroin rarely kills people. Heroin kills people with overdoses, but heroin withdrawals hardly ever kill people. I've been in on these, th these situations where we were trying to clean somebody up. It's not fun, and it's uh, dangerous. Uh, they have to be monitored by a doctor the entire time that they're going through their withdrawals because of the seizures. If they go into seizures and... Uh, well, if they go into seizures, then there's always a possibility that the individual is not going to survive. Delirium tremens usually begins 48 to 96 hours after the individual's last drink. That's two days to five days afterwards. The DTs can last for, from uh, three to ten days, with some serious cases extending into 50 days. 50 days of delirium tremens. That's, that's a month and a half. A month and two thirds, actually. Individuals who have gone through the DTs before uh, before seem to fear the powerful and frightening hallucinations that they suffer more than any other symptom. And I don't, it's gone. I think I've lost it. I don't see it here. Oh, rats. Uh, if you look at advertisements for alcohol, a lot of times you see really strange uh, faces in the, in the ice cubes monsters in the ice cubes. Why in the world would they do that? Why would Johnny Walker Red care about monsters? Why would there be monsters in their, in their ice cubes? And the answer is because they're trying to keep people who are really heavy, are heavy alcohol users, people who have been through the DTs, they're trying to remind them of delirium tremens. The reality is <clears throat> that 10% of the people that are alcoholics drink 80% of the alcohol. So they're not really talking, they're not really advertising for you and I. I don't drink at all, but they're not advertising for, for, for sometime drinkers. They're advertising for the people that drink a fifth of whiskey a day. Because they're, they're the ones that uh, they can get to uh, buy a lot of their alcohol. 80% of their alcohol sales is to alcoholics. So they put all these monsters in the advertisements and people like you and I are going, uh, that's no big deal. I don't care about that. That doesn't make me want to drink alcohol. But if, I, if we were alcoholics, we would want to drink that alcohol because we would want to stay away from the delirium tremens. 
Individuals who have gone through DTs, uh, we've already seen, talked about that. Severe symptoms uh, develop after prolonged heavy drinking, 48 to 87 consecutive days of heavy drinking. Uh, drinking alcohol creates neurotransmitter crises in the brain because alcohol increases the effectiveness of the GABA, which uh, blocks the chemicals that induce energy. The person becomes drowsy and the bodily functions become depressed. Uh, the brain, however, compensates by increasing energy chemicals and creating a state of hyperarousal. Uh, when withdrawal takes place after heavy alcohol usage, the hyperproduction of the energy and, and feel-good chemicals reverses itself, and they are produced at a lower level than normal. So now all of a sudden, whereas before they were trying, they were drinking alcohol to keep from being depressed, now they're, they're, they're very depressed because the neurotransmitters in your brain, the dopamine, the... Uh, the serotonin, the norepinephrine, uh, they, those levels have gone down by 30%. So whereas they were drinking to be happy, now they are, now they, because they're not drinking, they feel unhappy. And so they, are, they become naturally depressed. The decrease of, of energy chemicals causes tachycardia, anxiety, increased muscular activity, hypertension, and seizures. The activity of serotonin is a good example. Serotonin is reduced by 30% when heavy drinkers stop drinking, causing anxiety and depression during withdrawals. Over the last century, many sociological experiments have been conducted to reduce the effects of alcohol abuse. Remember, we had a really serious problem with alcohol to the extent that we prohibited it in 1919. We passed, uh, prohibition passed in 1920. Uh, but most of the states had already uh, prohibited alcohol use, and it's because of all of these horrible things uh, that alcohol does to people. So we have been trying, uh, be, since we need the money, for some reason, we, money's more important than people, uh, in the United States, uh, we have uh, tried uh, different techniques uh, to, uh, to, to combat alcohol abuse, uh, one of them is raising the drinking age. Drinking age in some states was 18. Uh, in, uh, in Europe, it's 16. But, of course, we don't care about the Europeans. Uh, we're talking about Americans. But uh, uh, they were trying to raise the uh, drinking age to 21. And they were successful in 49 out of 50 states. And there was one state that was a holdout. And that state was Louisiana. And the reason Louisiana was a holdout was because of Mardi Gras. They made almost all the money that Louisiana makes, they make during that strange period called Mardi Gras. And uh, of course the drinking age was, legal drinking age was 18. And they decided that uh, the money that they were getting from, uh, from Mardi Gras was a lot more important than, than the money that the federal government was offering them. So they, uh, they, they uh, refused to lower the drinking, or the, raise the drinking age to 21. And because of that, they lost all their federal, their, all their federal uh, uh, highway money. They lost all their highway money. <clears throat> so all the interstates that went through the state of Louisiana were in really bad repair. Uh, and this went on for about 15 years. And then finally, Louisiana raised their drinking age to 21. Uh, they also had an open container law in, in uh, Louisiana. Uh, where you could walk around with a glass of, uh, of alcohol. In most states, it's against the law. In all states, it's against the law. Uh, but they, they changed the, uh, the drinking laws so that they could get the, the uh, federal funding for their roads. Techniques to lower the uh, child abuse in the home, limiting the sale of alcohol. Uh, some states, uh, the only... Uh, in Ohio, you could only uh, buy alcohol at a uh, government facility. Uh, nobody else was allowed to, to uh, sell alcohol. It's not that way anymore. Now you can get it at a convenience store or whatever. Uh, working to lower the stress in everyday life, of course. All of these, none of these have really worked very well. Most illicit drug users also drink. Most alcohol abusers use other drugs. A study in Europe in 2003 found that 600 adolescent drug users, 80% use both marijuana and alcohol. Similar study in the United States of Adolescents in Treatment found that 96% used alcohol with other drugs. 
So we're not talking about, the, the reality is when we argue about alcohol, we argue about marijuana, usually what we're talking about is just alcohol or just marijuana. It's really difficult to, to uh, talk about polydrug usage. Uh, but the reality is, as you can see, 96% of the people that drink use other drugs as well. So it's really a, a, a moot uh, argument. Uh, the reality is if we're going to talk about marijuana, we also need to talk about alcohol at the same time. And this is the problem uh, with legalizing marijuana. People aren't just talking about marijuana. They think they're talking about marijuana. But what we really need to talk about is mixing marijuana with cocaine, mixing marijuana with methamphetamines. We need to talk about what happens when you drink alcohol and, and smoke marijuana at the same time, a lot of times it causes individuals to become quite violent. And this is, of course, is something that nobody wants to talk about. Uh, there are no uh, websites on the internet talking about uh, legalizing marijuana and then mixing, you know, and, and what happens when people drink alcohol at the same time. There are no sites. They're just, let's legalize marijuana. That's the only uh, website that you see. <clears throat> A study in 2006 in the United States found that among heavy drinkers, 32.2% used illicit drugs at the same time. So we have to talk about polydrug use if we're going to talk about uh, inebriation. 95% uh, of drinkers also smoke cigarettes, while 70% of alcoholics are heavy smokers, as compared to 25% of the general population. So evidently the two go together. Uh, I used to have a friend. She wasn't my girlfriend, she was a friend. We played softball together, she played third base, I played left field. So I got to, I got to watch her butt as she said, okay, anyway, <laughs> she was right in front of me. <laughs> uh, just take that butt part out. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, and I didn't drink, I, I still didn't drink, but uh, they would, uh, eventually they induced me to come to the bar with them. I don't know why, they, I guess they wanted me to watch them drink. Anyway, that's what happened. I sat there and watched them drink, and she didn't smoke. She was not a, a non-smoker, but when she got a, a little tipsy on, a, after a couple beers, she started smoking like a chimney. It was the weirdest thing in the world. This lady who, who hated cigarettes uh, would smoke cigarettes if she, get, she got a little bit drunk, as weird as that is. And she was a health nut. So drinking, well, drinking was okay. Drinking actually is not bad for you. Uh, one or two drinks is not bad for you, but uh, tobacco is always bad for you. And the only time she would drink or smoke, uh, smoke cigarettes was if um, she was drinking. Tobacco and alcohol are used to facilitate social situations, or they used to be used, I guess they're not, well, maybe they are, still are. When alcohol and marijuana are used together, it accelerates relaxation. Uh, it accelerates things, and sometimes if the uh, individual is unhappy when they, they're smoking pot, trying to relax, trying to come down off of an uh, 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 anger, uh, sometimes it will, the alcohol will exacerbate the anger rather than uh, do anything about uh, the relaxation. Drinking before using cocaine will uh, prolong and intensify the effects of the cocaine, though it decreases the, pro the predisposition for violence. Alcohol will facilitate an individual's ability to come down off of methamphetamines. Compulsive gamblers drink while gambling or they gamble while they're drinking. It's really kind of a toss-up as to which comes first, the chicken or the egg, which comes first, the gambling or the alcohol. <laughs> Unfortunately, many times with uh, mental disorders, uh, many times people with mental disorders will use alcohol to relieve their symptoms. Among men and women who are alcohol dependent, 4% suffer from bipolar disorder, four times the figure of the general population. So what are they doing? They're self-medicating. They're trying to control their symptoms with the alcohol. 5.3% of, of the general uh, public suffer from major depression, while 28% of the people diagnosed with alcohol dependence suffer from major depression. Uh, that's one quarter of all the people that drink alcohol have major depression. So it's another chicken and egg question. Is it the alcohol that's causing the depression or is it the depression that's causing them to drink? 16.4% of the general public suffer from anxiety while 37% of alcohol dependent people suffer from 
anxiety, 37%. That's one out of every three. That's why it's so dangerous to go into a bar. If you go into a bar, one-third of the population, one-third, one out of every three people in there potentially is in there drinking because they have anxiety problems, which means they're paranoid, which means, okay. So they are relatively kind of dangerous, especially since they're drinking alcohol. The alcohol takes away their inhibitions. So if this person thinks that you're a communist spy, I guess we don't think of communist spies anymore. They may think you're a terrorist because they are afraid of terrorists. Potentially, they're going to do something about it. They're going to attack you. So it's kind of dangerous to go into a place where people are drinking. Parties, bars, whatever. However, it is difficult to draw direct parallels between alcohol and mental illness because the effects of alcohol mirror and, or can create mental problems. Heavy drinking disrupts the neurotransmitters and the reward pathway that lead to feelings of well-being, the opioid peptides, dopamine, serotonin, GABA. In one detox center, 70% of the alcoholics were originally diagnosed as suffering from depression. And they probably really were. But after they, they uh, were treated for uh, their uh, alcohol dependence, only 30% were diagnosed as depressed. Any psychiatric diagnosis must always take into account the possibility of drug-induced symptoms. And this is one of the things we have to think about. A lot of times they don't want to tell you that they're, and they will tell you that they're, they can stop anytime they want. They're not really drug-dependent. They're not an alcoholic. Uh, they just drink sometimes. But there's a reason why they drink. And, well, anyway. So the first thing you need to do is, is bring them you need to cure them of their, their drug dependence first before you can treat their depression because you may, not, you, you may be treating empty symptoms. <clears throat> they may have the symptoms because they're drinking. So if you cure them uh, of their depression, well, you can't cure them of their depression for one thing because it's being, uh, it's being exacerbated by the alcohol. So you have, to, you have to detox them before you can start treating for them for their mental illness just to make sure that that's what their problem really is. Individuals diagnosed with antisocial personality disorder show symptoms of, wait a minute, you know what? I just figured out what happened. I think I did. Okay. Wait a second. <laughs> Remember those, uh, commercial, those advertisements I was telling you about before? Mm -hmm. I think I know where they are. I think I know what I've done. Go away. Take a quick look at these. <clears throat> I'll try to turn off the lights. Uh, I just pick. I just pull these off the internet at, at random. This is a Johnny Walker Red uh, advertisement. <clears throat> what we're looking for are monsters or faces. Remember, these are people that are having the DT. So there's they, if there's a dark spot in their room, they'll see a face in it. This is kind of a weird structure right here. This looks like a person, doesn't it? This black po portion right here kind of looks like a person. And we've got Johnny Walker walking. Up. This is this is a figure of Johnny Walker. It's, he's in flames. Does that seem a little weird to you? Yeah. Okay. I don't see it. But <laughs> oh, you don't see the Johnny Walker part? Uh -huh. Here's his foot. And here's his leg. See this guy right here? Okay. Okay, that's it's the same figure, but it's in flames. Oh. Okay. Isn't that strange? Now that does isn't gonna make you want to buy Johnny Walker red label. But if you were a good alcoholic, you've got you've got this strange black figure in here. Here's his arm, here's his one leg, and here's his other leg you got this really weird face right here. It looks almost like a goat. And you've got Johnny Walker in flames. 
Now remember, these people are suffering from the DTs. They're having hallucinations and, and uh, there are illusions. They feel like there are things crawling out of their skin. This is why they don't want to go through withdrawals. So with the, if, if I sell alcohol, I can sell it to this guy. This guy can drink a, 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 a fifth of alcohol a day. So I'm trying to sell it to him. I'm not trying to sell it to you or me. That wouldn't make any sense. Here, let's try another one. Uh, this is too small. You can't really see it. This has got two glasses, and there's, oh, there's all kinds of interesting figures. This is Jack Daniels. Interesting figures in the ice cubes. Let's see the last one. Yeah. If you come up here, you can see the face. There's a face in the ice cube. You see it? It's got a hat on. I see a fish. <laughs> see a face right there? You have two eyes. There's the I do face. see a monster, There's though. Because these look like tentacles or like a squid or something. There you go. Oh. Okay. It's like, um, what's his name? Warshocks? Or, um, or, yeah, Rorschach. Yeah, yeah they block block test. Test. <laughs> it feels like that. Well, it's always a possibility. <laughs> I know. So that doesn't affect you or, or I. And for that reason, of course, they go, there's nothing in there. They can, they can uh, they're, they're uh, talking to a very specific group of individuals. Uh, individuals who are suffering from the DTs. And because of that, and because it's such a small percentage of the population, they can claim that they didn't put they didn't put any figures in their in their advertisements. Whoops, I've gone too far. Uh, there we go. Okay, <clears throat> it's just kind of fun if you look at alcohol. Um, any alcoholic beverage advertisements. A lot of times you see these monsters in there. And of course they're very odd looking monsters. Individuals diagnosed with antisocial personality disorder show symptoms of impulsivity, lack of remorse for causing harm, inability to learn from their mistakes. These same symptoms are found in drug abusers including alcoholics. 80% of those diagnosed with antisocial personality disorder develop substance dependence. This is really kind of weird. If you've ever been around an alcoholic, they are the biggest liars in the world. And the reason they lie so much is so that they can continue drinking. People with antisocial personality disorder, biggest liars in the world. <clears throat> them and alcoholics. But we can put the two of them together because a lot of alcoholics uh, develop antisocial personality disorder symptoms so that they can continue drinking. They'll tell you anything that they have to. They'll, they'll create chaos. This is the biggest problem with living with an alcoholic is, is the fact that they will create chaos so that they, can, they, can, they will have an excuse to drink. So they tend to have uh, to maintain a household, if it's, if it's the male, even if it's a male or the female, they will maintain a household that is constantly in chaos. Because when it's chaotic like that, it's an excuse for them to drink. That makes sense. Yeah. So people who are children of alcoholics, they grow up in a house where it's, it's a chaotic household. And they think that this is normal behavior. So guess who they, they marry? Guess who they fall in love with? Fall in love with dad, of course, and mom, whichever the case may be. They fall in love with mom or dad. And of course, since they grew up in a household that was chaotic, they're looking for more chaos in their lives. So they tend to be attracted to bad boys. They are, tend to be attracted to that type of an individual. Mm -hmm. Yeah, man, you can tell them, tell them that all day long and they'll go, no, 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 I love, you know, I, I, I don't like that kind of behavior. I saw it in my dad and I just hate it. Well, no, that's not really true because when they're around somebody who is like that, they, when they're around somebody that's not like that, they find it boring because they're used to chaos. They're used to something happening all the time. They're used to, to family uh, interruptions. Not, it doesn't have to be violence. It can just be argument. It can be uh, conflict. 
They're looking for conflict all the time. And when, the, when they don't find the conflict, they reject the individual. As being boring, and the truth is they are boring because they don't argue, fight, and create chaos. If a mother drinks during pregnancy, especially the first trimester of her pregnancy, there is a great possibility that the alcohol will do damage to the fetus and she is more likely to miscarry or to cause infant death. Alcohol uh, intake during pregnancy is the leading cause of intellectual disability in the United States. Drinking during pregnancy, especially the first trimester. The problem is that she may not even know she's pregnant for the first month, for the first four weeks. She doesn't realize it until she's missed a period. And by that time, of course, the baby's brain has already started developing and she's already pickled the baby's brain. Uh, by drinking uh, to excess. Surveys of pregnant women in the United States show that 12.4% drank some, al some alcohol during several months of their pregnancy, 4% uh, used, uh, used in binge patterns, 0.7% were heavy drinkers, 18% smoked cigarettes, 4.3% used illicit drugs at least once during their pregnancy. So, you know, uh, if you think that all mothers are, go are, are good and, and want to take care of their babies, the reality is that we have relatively large percentages. I don't know how, how you like to look at these things, but this is, this is one out of every seven. Uh, as you can see, there's a lot of women that do things that they shouldn't do while they're pregnant. And, uh, okay. uh, one study of 293 infants born with fetal alcohol syndrome and alcohol-related neurodevelopmental disorder in Portland, Oregon, showed 39% or 89% were used uh, were, were using alcohol with at least two other drugs. 89%, 49% were using alcohol with cocaine, which is really dumb. 100% were smokers. Most were single mothers. Uh, most were high school dropouts. <clears throat> most had a history of sexual abuse or physical abuse. Hence, that's why they were, they were drinking and using drugs. Many had a history of, of drug or alcohol abuse in the family. Many had learning disabilities, disabilities which may have come from substance abuse effects when they were in the, the womb. So as you can see, this has, this has a cyclical effect. Uh, if your mom used, then there's a probability that it affected you in the womb, and then eventually, of course, you will use uh, in the future when you're pregnant. In the study of FAS at the University of Washington, uh, two groups of infants were followed into adolescence. Uh, by the age of five, 38% of the children's biological mothers had died of alcohol-related causes by the time they were five years old. Uh, one out of every three children had lost their mother to alcohol abuse. By the time the group reached the adolescence, 69% of the biological mothers had died of alcohol-related causes. By the time they were 13 years old, two-thirds of the mothers were dead. Alcohol consumption during pregnancy can cause three very varying degrees of problems. Fetal alcohol syndrome, which is retarded growth, facial deformities, problems with heart and limbs, central nervous system involvement, potentially lowered IQ with a range of 20 to 120 with a mean of 79, which is just barely above uh, intellectual disability. Alcohol-related neurodevelopmental disorder, alcohol-related birth defects, all three of these problems are referred to as fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. This is what it looks like when a mother drinks during pregnancy. This is what a normal baby's brain looks like. This is what a baby's brain looks like when it's been pickled in alcohol. As you can see, there's lots and lots of convolutions, lots of fissures, and as you can see here, the brain is much, much smaller. Uh, the corpus callosum, which is right here, uh, is it, almost non, it, it's right here. This little chunk right here is the corpus callosum. Yeah. So as you can see, the development is, is, re, is retarded. Uh, this is a normal baby's brain. This is a baby's brain who has FAS. As you can see, it's much, much smaller, and the convolutions and, and fissures are gone. Well, they're not gone. There are some there, but it is, as you can see, it's much, much smaller. 
As it turns out, uh, alcohol has an affinity for brain tissue. And when the baby is developing, of course, it goes right to whatever the baby's brain looks like at the time. Uh, the baby, when a baby's brain is developing, uh, it's just tiny cells that we're looking at. Uh, by the time the baby is done, if the mother is, is a heavy drinker, of course, this is what we're going to have. Now, what's the probability that this baby's going to grow up normally? And the answer is zero percent. Sorry, the baby is uh, going to have a problem for, all, for its entire life. A child who suffers from the less severe forms of FASD, ARND, or ARBD uh, may have an IQ ranging from 49 to uh, 142. 142 is a genius, but 49 is not. <laughs> with a mean score of 90, though they will have other problems, difficulty with short-term memory, problems storing and retrieving information, difficulty forming links and making associations, problems making judgments and forming relationships, uh, difficulty controlling temper and aggression, oversensitivity to bright lights, loud noises, sharp smells, textures and tastes of food. Now if we look at this, oversensitivity to these things, that looks like autism. So what you're doing is you're, uh, if you drink during pregnancy, then your child will have some degree of autism. Worldwide, uh, fetal alcohol syndrome rates range from 0.33 to 2.9 uh, uh, cases per 1,000 births through the figures uh, vary, but though the figures vary by country in the use of alcohol. In the United States, the rates are 0.2 to 1.5 per 1,000 births. Uh, for Asians and whites, it's between 1 and 2 per 1,000. For African Americans, it's 6 per 1,000, so it's almost six times six times higher for African Americans. For American Indians, depending on the tribe and the region that they live in, it's somewhere between 10 and 120 per thousand. So there are some areas of the country, there are some tribes that have one out of every uh, 10 ch ch child born in that tribe has fetal alcohol syndrome. There are some tribes where one out of every eight children born to that uh, to women of that tribe have fetal alcohol syndrome. It's not that bad here. This is this isn't the place. It's no, the northern plains. It's uh, the Lakota uh, in in uh, North Dakota. They're the ones that have the biggest problem. So you know when you guys complain about alcohol on, on uh, Navajo reservation. I just remember what I saw up in, up on the northern plains. So it could be worse. I'm sorry? It could be worse. I it could be worse here? Yeah. It's, well, it could be as bad as it is up there, but it's not, thank goodness. Uh, the incident, incidence of ARND and ARBD are about three times that of FAS in all groups in the United States. The most destructive time to consume alcohol for the fetus is the third week through the eighth week of gestation when the brain, brain is forming. And as I said before, she may not even realize she's pregnant. At week three, she hasn't missed a period yet. So she may not know that she's pregnant. So she may be binging. The corpus callosum is forming at this time. The basal ganglia is forming. Brain cell migration and organization are taking place. Uh, during the second trimester, the facial features are forming and can be deformed by alcohol use. Uh, during the third trimester, the hippocampus is forming, which might impair the encoding of visual and auditory information. The most destructive period of drinking for a fetus to be, is to drink in a rapid manner. Uh, it is uh, the concentration that is destructive in drinking in that uh, manner intensifies concentration. Studies have shown that seven drinks per week is the minimum, minimum baseline for negative neurodevelopmental behaviors or effects, but if the mother is consuming all of her alcohol in a binge pattern, the pattern becomes more important than the volume. So if she's sitting down and she's drinking seven, seven shots of uh, tequila uh, at a time, but she's abstaining the rest of the week, she's still pickling the baby's brain because the baby's getting seven shots of tequila 
uh, all at once, one shot. During the growth period, alcohol contact for four hours is enough to kill brain cells. The only logical drinking pattern for a pregnant woman is total abstinence, if they don't want the baby affected. Alcoholic fathers can also transmit mutated genes in their sperm due to the consumption of alcohol. Uh, while this can't uh, lead to FAS, male children can suffer from other intellectual and functional deficits, impaired verbal skills, impaired thinking processes, impaired planning skills, problems with visual spatial skills, problems with motor skills, memory deficits, and learning impairment. Alcohol interferes with the main inhibitory neurotransmitter in the brain, GABA, which reduces inhibitions. People with pre-existing aggressive tendencies will become more aggressive with the use of alcohol. There's a shock for you. 30% of the victims of violent crimes report that the perpetrator had been drinking uh, alcohol before the offense. In 15% uh, of the robberies, 25% of aggravated assaults, and 50% of the homicides, the individual who was the perpetrator was drinking before, uh, before the uh, uh, crime occurred. When arrested, alcohol levels of probationers was, was 0 0.18, uh, which is over twice normal, uh, the drunk range. Uh, when arrested, alcohol levels of local jail inmates was 0 0.20, which is also two times above, two and a half times actually. When arrested, alcohol levels of state prisoners was 0 0.28, three times above the uh, normal level, or that's not normal level, but the drunk level. In a study from Memphis, Tennessee, uh, of domestic violence calls, 92% of the perpetrators had consumed alcohol the day of the disturbance. Now this is a really serious problem, and the reason I say it's a really serious problem is because some people will excuse individuals who have been drinking. They say they were in their right mind, and of course they're not in their right mind. So do we just let them off the hook if they were drunk? That's the question, and there are a lot of people that would, would choose to do that. 67% of the perpetrators had used cocaine the day of the disturbance. Half had used alcohol and or cocaine uh, often during the last 30 days. And these are the individuals who were beating up their wives. Alcohol encourages the release of pent-up anger, hatred, and desires that are normally controlled by society. The drunk's mo uh, moral judgment and reasoning are impaired by the alcohol. 34 to 74% of perpetrators of sexual assault had been drinking before the assault, 34 to 74 percent. So it's not their fault because they were drinking. So it's okay to rape somebody if you, you're, you're drunk. And actually judges have said that. I know. 30 to 79 percent of the victims of sexual assault had been drinking prior to the assault. These are the victims. It's okay to, for a drunk man to, to rape a drunk woman. It's okay for him to sexually assault her. Or is it? Is this a good excuse? They were both drinking. This was a really serious problem in the military. <clears throat> when I was in the service, of course, this is in the 1970s and 1980s, when I was in the service, <clears throat> this was a relatively common practice. Uh, everybody went to the bar, uh, both the the male and the female got drunk, uh, they ended up in bed together, and nobody complained. But now in the service, but then they, had, they started having problems with women who had been drinking, uh, and men were, were, uh, were predators. They were, they were uh, stalking them, and they were assaulting them when they were drunk, since they had already this had, uh, was, was a common, relatively common practice. Uh, they just allowed it to happen uh, in the military. And then they realized this is dumb, the dumbest thing in the world. If we're going to have this many females in the military, we got to protect them somehow. And so they decided that uh, a woman who has been uh, drinking uh, cannot give her consent to have sex. So if one or both of them have been drinking, then they can't have sex because they can't consent. And 
that's the that's the way it is now in the in the military. So they have to if they're going to have sex, they have to agree to it before before she starts drinking. That's the law <clears throat> in the military. Before it was ugly. It was really ugly. Um, I had a friend who was a nurse, a uh, very attractive young lady. She looked like Barbara Eden, if you know what. I Dream of Jeannie, the lady on I Dream, she was identical to it. Uh, anyway, she was, the first day she was on base, uh, she went to the officer's club and got drunk. She was followed up to her car by the base commander, and the base commander had sex with her in the back seat of her car. She didn't want to have sex with him, but since she was drunk, she couldn't say, according to the old rules, she couldn't say no. And it didn't matter whether she said yes or no. She couldn't say no. So what happens when the the top dog at, at the uh, at the institution uh, rapes somebody? What happens next? Well, the answer was nothing happened. Next. She she couldn't prefer charges against him, even even though she was she was a non consenting adult, consenting adult as far as she was concerned. But since she was drunk, she couldn't say no. And that's the way it used to be. <clears throat> in 2005, 40% of the motor vehicle fatalities involved alcohol. That's 16,885 dead people because of alcohol. 90% of those, these situations involved a blood alcohol level of 0 0.08 or higher. Uh, 275,000 injuries occurred at the same time. There's nothing more irritating than being killed by a drunk driver. Uh, up north, um, the uh, dean of students, her, she had two sons, uh, real nice kids. Uh, one of them uh, was drinking one night, and uh, he was driving down. This is in Montana, where there it re actually is no speed limit, really, kind of. Uh, if you're driving erratically, they'll stop you. But uh, if you're driving 70 or 80 miles an hour on a two-lane paved highway, you're probably okay. They probably won't stop you. Well, he was driving over 100 miles an hour. Uh, he was going around a curve. He didn't see the guy in front of him, or, and he was drunk. Uh, he rammed him. He hit him from behind, and it killed all the people in the car that he, just, that he ran into. It didn't hurt him, but he killed, he killed the, uh, everybody in the, in the car. Uh, it was a, uh, a uh, older man and his uh, grandson were killed. Um, the kid's still in jail. They, they got him for vehicular manslaughter, and he's still in jail. But uh, you should have heard what the, uh, the dean of, of students, you should have heard her excuses for why her son, the fact that her son wasn't guilty and should be let out of prison. You should have heard the excuses. It's really hard to, to make excuses for somebody that, gets so, that is so drunk that, when they, that they can't see a car in front of them, and they ram it. What was she saying? Well, she was just saying it wasn't his fault. Mm -hmm. uh, the bars were too far apart. He needed to go home. His girlfriend was coming in the next day. I, there, you know, anything, because her, her child couldn't possibly be a, a criminal. Mm -hmm. But, of course, he's still in jail. Daniel, he was one of my students, actually. As sad as that is. <clears throat> It wasn't a couple weeks later that uh, the ex exact same thing happened. Uh, he would, the uh, person that he killed was white, and he was native, of course. It wasn't uh, a couple weeks later that the opposite happened. Uh, there was a woman that was pregnant uh, with, uh, she was eight months pregnant, and her boyfriend, and uh, they were driving down the street, and they got ran from behind by a drunk guy in a pickup truck, a jacked up pickup truck, and it just, he just went right over them. Uh, killed them both. Uh, of course, he killed the baby as well, but uh, he wasn't hurt at all because he was he was in a jacked up truck mm -hmm. and it just it just ran over the top of him and uh, killed them both. Uh, it uh, tore the the the, uh, the wheels off of his car. Uh, he was he was a mutter. He was a white guy, a mutter. He was 
he drove in those mud rallies. Where oh. they, okay. And it was one of it was a vehicle that he drove in a mud rally. Anyway, so the opposite happened. You know, it was wasn't two or three weeks later that that uh, two individuals, two, two native individuals, died uh, from a, a white guy ramming ramming them from behind. It was almost at the same exact same spot. Actually, he got him before the curve, and the other guy, he was going around the curve, and he didn't really see him. He was on the other side of the curve. Anyways, it's the same curve, though, as weird as that is. However, an aggressive advertising uh, campaign and more aggressive sentencing for DUI infractions has reduced traffic fatalities by 18%. Uh, they were talking about, DU, DUIs are really strange in, in Montana. Uh, you can accumulate uh, a number of them without anything happening to you. Uh, eventually, of course, you're going to get thrown in jail. Uh, there was one guy that accumulated 13 DUIs, and finally they threw him in jail. He had killed like six people in, with all of those DUIs, but finally they threw him in jail and took his, his license away from him. But that's in Montana. Uh, how stupid can you be? <laughs> uh, one in four drunks drive within two hours of their last drink. On any given weekday uh, night uh, between 10 p.m. and 1 a.m., one out of every uh, 13 drivers is legally drunk. One out of every 13. On weekend uh, mornings between 1 and 6 a.m., one in seven drivers is drunk. A real dangerous time to be on the reservation and driving around would be early in the morning, sometime after these guys get out of the bars. And, of course, they have to... Uh, Hopefully, they're off the reservation. They're drinking off the reservation. So they have to drive home, right? Okay. Real dangerous time to be driving around. Window rock, ship rock, you don't want to, yeah, real dangerous. Probably in Saley, you're okay because it's so far away. If they're going to run off the road and kill somebody, they'll, they will have done it before they get all the way here, hopefully. But if Scott were in the room, he used to talk about driving drunk, and he said he could drive very well with one eye closed. So he's got no depth perception, but uh, he was able to drive without any problems. If convicted DUI perpetrators, 61% uh, uh, drank beer only, 2% uh, drank uh, wine only, 18% uh, drank liquor only, and 20% mixed their drinks, beer and alcohol, or beer and uh, but yeah, as you can see, uh, just because you're drinking beer doesn't mean that you're not drunk. A lot of them are drunk, or are drinking beer. Alcohol-related crashes cost an estimated $148 billion in the United States every year. Uh, blood alcohol level of 0 0.08 is the legal limit for driving under the influence. Uh, the individual does not have the, to show impairment to be guilt, found guilty. If they have a, a blood alcohol level of 0 0.08, no matter what their tolerance level is, uh, they will be arrested for driving under the influence, whether they're uh, impaired or not. It is estimated that only one driver is arrested for every 300 to 1,000 drunk driving trips. So there you go. What has worked over the years to reduce traffic deaths due to alcohol? Lowering the legal inebriation levels from 0 0.10 to 0 0.08. Uh, imposing immediate license revocation for individuals whose uh, blood alcohol level uh, exceeds the uh, level limit, legal limit. Uh, increasing the legal drinking age from 18 to 21 reduced uh, drunk driving uh, markedly because, you know, teenagers like to drink and they think that they're okay. Uh, their brains are, haven't developed that far yet, so they think they can do it. Maintaining zero tolerance for youth under 21 who are caught DUI. This has reduced crashes involving youth 17 to 50%. In other words, you just, you just take their license away from them and don't give it back to them until they reach the age of 21. Uh, impounding or towing vehicles of DUIs requiring mandatory treatment for DUI arrest. Uh, restees, uh, dram laws, uh, those uh, who serve are liable for a customer who becomes intoxicated. Now this not, may not make a whole lot of sense to people, but the reality is the bartender knows who is drunk and who is not drunk. And if he allows somebody to leave his bar drunk who is going to drive, then he's liable. That's weird. 
Well, it's not. 22 states have these laws. 14 have limited dram laws. Uh, so in 22 states, if I am a bartender and I serve somebody and they walk out the door drunk and then they get into an automobile accident and somebody dies, I'm liable. My son was a bartender. He was real serious about this stuff. And the reason he was real serious about this stuff is because he didn't drink. So he was very much aware of what was going on around him. A lot of bartenders are drinkers as well, and they make the same excuses that everybody else does. But uh, he was not. And he said, this is a good law. He stopped a lot of people. He put a lot of people in, in uh, taxis uh, who couldn't function. He took a lot of people's keys away. And then, of course, the next day they came in. And usually, a lot of times, they got angry with him. But my son's a bodybuilder. You really don't want to, you don't want to <laughs> yell at him. <laughs> you don't want to yell at him too much. He's pretty even-tempered. But, you know, you don't want to get into, into his face. He's uh, kind of dangerous. I don't go to bars that often. But, like, when I were little, Tyler kind of, like, sightseeing. Um, some people, like, we would talk with a bartender sometimes, and they would say, like, oh, yeah, but we, we used to close until 3, but, and then we just kept shortening it until 1. And I'm like, why? He's like, so there's an hour between there where we serve coffee to everybody. Right. So they said, then everybody kind of sobers up, and then they could go home. Is that here in Arizona? Um, there's one in Gallup where we went to, and in she Mexico. said they do that. Yeah. yeah. And then the other one's... Um, Mill Avenue, where they said they start they started doing that too. I think both New Mexico and Arizona have dram laws, so the bar could be held liable. Whoops. <laughs> Medical reports in, uh, involving alcohol: fifteen to twenty-five percent of emergency room patients reported the use of alcohol, especially those involved in fights, assaults, and, and falls. Nothing's more irritating than having uh, a drunk person come in uh, when you're trying to take care of an automobile accident and a gunshot wound and you've got all of these really serious people and then the alcoholic or the drunk guy comes in. Mm -hmm. And of course, he's screaming for, for attention because his arm hurts or whatever. Uh, and, and you've got to treat him. I mean, it's not like you can, you can refuse to uh, treatment. Uh, but usually they're not as serious, but they are a lot more vocal. Uh, than the other individuals. And of course, you want to save people's lives. So, But uh, alcohol is really irritating as far as emergency room personnel are concerned. Uh, most emergency room personnel do not are not drinkers. They're not imbibers. They don't just laugh these things off. This is real serious stuff as far as they're concerned. I mean, I, I told you that my mother used to tell me stories she, when she was working in the emergency room about what was going on. And it's one of the reasons why I developed the feelings and the ideas that I have is because uh, I heard all these stories. I did, heard these stories while I was growing up. And it's, it, uh, she always made it sound like they were the dumbest people in the world because they'd been drinking and driving. And these were some of the mo more important people in our hometown. Uh, here they, they came into the emergency room with a, this cut on their face or their cut on their, uh, cut on their arm because they'd been drinking and driving or drinking and walking, so which is kind of dangerous as well. Alcoholics are 16 times more likely to die in falls and 10 times more likely to be burned to death in a fire. A lot of times they will pass out and with a lit, lit cigarette. Then all of a sudden the house is on fire and they can't, they're passed out so they can't move. 31% of boating fatalities have had a blood alcohol of 0 0.10 or more. Uh, there, there was a uh, really good pitcher, a uh, pitch from Miami. It was almost unhittable. Uh, the first year he pitched, he won, I don't know, 19 games and lost two or something. His name was Fernandez, a uh, really good, good player. Uh, the next year, uh, just before, uh, just at the end of spring training, he was out in a boat, and uh, whoever whoever was driving, I don't think he was driving. I think somebody else was driving. Anyway, they ran into a rock, and the the, the boat exploded and killed everybody on the boat, including this fabulous pitcher. 
course, everybody, and, and his blood alcohol level is like 1 point, uh, 0.18, you know, three times normal, um, three times drunk. So a lot of people went, oh, my goodness, this is terrible. He's only 19 or 20 years old. But, uh, you know, dead's dead, no matter how old you are. 31% of boating fatalities, 40% of industrial fatalities, and 47% of injuries involve alcohol. Alcoholics commit suicide at twice the rate of the general population. Um, the typical uh, alcoholic suicide, uh, it's a white male who's middle-aged. He's not married, and he has a long history of drinking. And of course, that is the picture painted of these drums. Uh, culture determines how an individual will consume alcohol. Wet cultures such as Austria, Belgium, France, Italy, and Switzerland sanction daily use of alcohol. Uh, they integrate social drinking into everyday life. Uh, they serve watered-down wine to children with meals, and this is legal in their countries. Uh, they drink more beer and wine than dry cultures, and this is a wet culture. So you can look at the, at the uh, names up here, Austria, Belgium, France, Italy, Switzerland, these are all wet cultures where there's a lot of drinking taking place. Uh, and of course, they, they almost train uh, to drink because they drink every day. They start as children with watered down wine and uh, they drink a lot more than most people do. So if you go to France, Italy, Switzerland, Belgium, or Austria, then you will find a lot of people drinking. And as Americans, of course, when we go to a wet culture and we're sitting down with somebody from that culture, do we drink at, try to drink at the same level? And the answer is probably yes. Now the interesting thing about Belgium is that Belgium owns all the beer companies in the United States. Budweiser is now owned by a Belgian company a Belgian company, as weird as that is. The, I think the only independent uh, out, uh, beer companies in the United States are Miller's and, no, that's not true. Coors is owned by Molson now. Coors is owned by a, a, a Canadian beer company. So Miller may be the only American-owned beer company in the United States. Dry cultures such as uh, they have in Denmark, Finland, Norway, and Sweden, restrict alcohol use with heavy taxing. They consume more distilled spirits, about 50% more. Uh, they, uh, they are characterized by binge drinking, particularly males on the weekend. Uh, the interesting thing about the, the, these are all Scandinavian countries. The inter interesting thing about Scandinavian countries is they, if you ever get a DUI, you lose your license forever, for life. You can never drive a car again. And this is the reason that they only drink on the weekends. They don't go home. Yeah, they don't go to bars on on Wednesday night and have a, just have a beer and then go home, because if they get caught, and their their legal drinking uh, level is zero or alcohol level zero point zero four, so it's half what it is in the United States. That's half a beer. So they don't do that. When they do drink, when they binge drink over the on the weekends. They do it at home, or they do it at a bar, and then they, they get a taxi to go home. They don't want to lose their license forever. <clears throat> Mixed cultures such as uh, that in Canada, England, uh, Germany, Ireland, and the United States uh, demonstrate patterns of binge drinking. Uh, binge drinking is very popular in the United States. Uh, as a matter of fact, they used to advertise uh, binge drinking. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's Friday, so let's all get drunk. Uh, have a, they have a higher incidence of violence to women than either the wet or dry cultures. Uh, domestic violence in Canada is, is about one and a half times what it is in the United States. Now, one of the interesting things about Canada is when we had prohibition in the United States, they didn't have prohibition in Canada. So Canadians drink a lot harder alcohol than we do in the United States. When we, when we went through pro prohibition, uh, we stopped drinking um, whiskey. We stopped drinking the uh, uh, distilled spirits. So when people started drinking again, what did they drink? They drank beer, they drank wine. They drank uh, more watered down alcohol. Uh, 
but in if you go to Canada and you go to a bar, uh, you know, in the United States, if you go to a bar, practically everybody's got a beer in front of them. If you go to Canada and you go to a bar, practically everybody's got a mixed drink in front of them. They don't, they, you know, you drink beer at home. You don't drink beer at the bar. It's it's a waste of money to buy beer at the bar. <clears throat> so you drink you drink heavier uh, alcohol. I played a lot of softball up in Montana. I played a lot of softball with Canadian teams coming down, and they they drank a lot more than we did, uh, and they drank heavier, uh, heavier, heavier alcohol. Russia has had an alcohol soap culture for 500 years. Uh, vodka is traditionally drunk between meals in large quantities, and this is the way they do it in Russia. Form of prohibition that started in, in 1985 resulted in illegal manufacture and 11,000 alcohol poisoning deaths. Oh, he's limping. How's your ankle? It's good. I'm just okay. keeping it wrapped. Yeah, yeah, you're doing okay. I'm, I'm impressed. Uh, the male life expectancy actually rose in Russia during the prohibition period. Uh, this is 1985. The, the wall went down in 1989. Um, the Soviet Union collapsed in 1990. As soon as the prohibition ended, alcohol poisonings increased to 40,000 per year. Uh, male life expectancy dropped by six years in one year because they were drinking so much alcohol. And when they drink alcohol, they're drinking vodka. Vodka is real close to pure alcohol. It's about as close as you can get without, well, ever clear as pure alcohol. But it's a, probably the strongest drink, uh, the highest alcohol content that you can get. If you're drinking tequila or mezcal or uh, gin or whatever, uh, you're probably drinking somewhere in the 30 to 40 percent uh, alcohol range. Vodka is in the 50 to 70 percent alcohol range. So that's some really, really strong stuff. So vodka is really not healthy for you as compared to other drinks? Or is it just all the same? It has more, it's a stronger drink. So if you have something mixed with vodka, yeah. then okay, unless you mix it with a lot of something, then it's, it's going to be a strong drink. Okay. 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 What, what, what drink are we talking about? I don't know. Oh. Uh, okay. <laughs> yeah, shots of tequila and shots of vodka. Vodka will get you drunk twice as fast as tequila will. Because tequila doesn't have that much alcohol in it. Not nearly as much as vodka. Tequila's got enough alcohol in it, okay? Whiskey has, a lot of, has a, a, enough alcohol in it to get you drunk real fast. But vodka has more. This is almost pure alcohol. In England, 70% of the population drinks regularly. Uh, Two-thirds of the consumption of alcohol is in the form of beer, usually warm with darts. Uh, the darts have to do with throwing darts. The more they drink, of course, the worse they... They're not very accurate. Recent attempts to curb the destruction of alcohol on the, in, on the British public has been in the form of prohibiting happy hours. And other, they don't have happy hour in England. Uh, allowing the pubs to stay open past 11 uh, to reduce the need uh, for binge drinking, and that's what they were doing in England. Uh, they were closing the pubs at 11 o'clock, and so these guys were drinking lots of beers right before closing time. Now remember, it takes you 60 to 90 minutes before you, you have your peak alcohol level. So after you take your last drink, it's an hour to an hour and a half later is when you're the drunkest. So if they were closing at 11 o'clock, they were leaving at 11 o'clock, they were drinking right up to 11 o'clock, and then they were leaving, and of course, an hour later, they were drunk, drunk as skunks, and they were beating somebody up. Uh, the Brits are, are big on beating each other up, uh, but sometimes, of course, they're hitting their wives, and that's not good. Encourage the, encouraging the English to reduce average consumption to three, time, three drinks a day, and of course, when you go to the pub, if you watch uh, uh, any English television, they're always drinking beers at the pub. And of course, their alcohol is a lot stronger than, or their beer is a lot stronger than ours. It's about twice as strong 
Ours is tends to be 3.2 beer, 3.2% alcohol. Uh, theirs is somewhere in the 6 to 11% range, their beer. And for that reason, it's a lot more bitter than American beer. So if you go to Germany or England or Australia or even up into Canada and drink Molson's, their beer is going to be a lot stronger than American beer. On the average, men drink more, uh, more per drinking episode than women do. Men, are also, men also tend to have more a, a adverse social and legal effects from the alcohol. Women tend to increase their drinking after they pass 30 years of, uh, of age. Uh, even when they are dependent on alcohol, women drink a third less than men who are dependent. Uh, hereby, factors seem to be stronger in, uh, I'm sorry, hereditary factors seem to be stronger in women when it comes to alcohol. Female alcoholics have 50 to 100% higher death rates than male alcoholics. Cirrhosis of the liver, circulatory disorders, suicide, and accidents. Uh, tend to be higher uh, with women. The younger the, an individual starts using alcohol or tobacco, the more likely they will have a problem with the substances uh, later in life. 6.2% uh, of eighth uh, graders have been drunk in the past month. 18.8% uh, of 10th graders have been drunk in the past month. 30% of 12th graders have been drunk in the past month. Eighth graders, eighth graders, 6.2% of them have been drunk at some point during the month. Immaturity of adolescent brain can lead to unwise decisions. When disinhibiting factors of alcohol is thrown into the mix, the individual is more likely to drive drunk. And of course, the biggest problem isn't um, 30 and 40 year old uh, drunk drivers, it's teenagers. Uh, if you're 30 or 40 years old or you're, uh, you're uh, an adult, uh, the probability is that you can probably get home. But if you're 18 or 19 years old and you're drunk as a scum, you've only been driving for two years, yeah, the probability you're going to have a problem is, is fairly high. Unplanned pregnancy, of course, because, you know, everybody likes to have sex when they're, they've been drinking. Uh, sexual aggression uh, by males, this is very relatively common. Uh, the reality is, as men uh, get more and more drunk, they're less and less functional as far as sex is concerned. They become less functional. And so they become more frustrated. So they're more likely to uh, take out their sexual frustration on the female by blaming her for his problem. And his problem, of course, has to do with alcohol. It doesn't really have to do with the fact that he's, he's uh, not very sexually functional. Drinking during adolescence leads to limited emotional growth. College students are adolescents in, into their junior year. 44% uh, of our best and brightest admit to binge drinking. About half the binge drinking college students admit that their grades fall into the C or F range. The reality is the first beer I ever had was when I was in college. And I started college at age 17. So I had my first beer at age, age 17. I thought it tasted horrible. I, that's not something I wanted to drink. I would much rather drink a Coke or I'd much rather drink something that tasted good than drink that crap. It tastes so bad. So I, that was that and the fact that my mother had been planting this seed of alcohol is stupid in my brain for, uh, for years. Uh, but there were a lot of people that I was around in college who were, despite the fact that they were underage, they were drinking a lot of alcohol. Many also admit to missing class on a regular basis because they're, they're hungover. A national study showed a direct correlation between the number of drinks consumed per week and the individual's grade point average. Women are more sensitive to the de deleterious effects of alcohol on their grades, so it's a lot worse for women than it is for men. 86% will show the same pattern of drinking that they developed in high school. So if you were a drinker in high school, you're going to be a drinker in college, unfortunately. It's not like you get smarter when you go to college. You get dumber, actually, when you go to college. By graduation, the college-educated drink uh, uh, less than their non-college attending peers. Males drink uh, binge more than females, 86. 48.6% compared to 40.9%. 40 
50.2% of white students binge as compared to 34.4% of Hispanic students, 26.2% of Asian students, and 21.7% of blacks. Now, as you can see, there's a huge discrepancy between white students, Hispanic students, Asian students, and black students. This idea that, that uh, blacks use drugs a lot heavier than anybody else, that they drink a lot more, is just not really true. But if you were looking for professional drinkers, it's these guys right here. It's the white population. They drink a lot more than just about everybody. Fraternity residents binge at 75.4%. Dormitory residents binge at 45.3%. Off-campus residents binge at 54.5%. Married residents binge at 26.5%. The responsible ones who have to be responsible, they binge drink less than, it, than everybody else. College drinking least is 1,700 deaths per year, 690,000 physical assaults, 599,000 injuries, and 97,000 sexual assaults. This whole idea that if a woman is drunk, you can have sex with her. This is not an uncommon idea, and it's not just males that have this idea. There's a certain percentage of females that have, have the same idea. Uh, I don't know. Okay. Uh, intelligence about drinking doesn't increase with age. 2,500,000 Americans have alcohol-related problems as patterns develop, sometimes as preadolescents. Uh, can continue into old age. So whatever you did as a child. Now the problem is that when you start drinking, your brain stops maturing. This is really kind of weird. So if you started drinking at 14 and you stop drinking at 40, your brain is still at the maturity level of a 14 year old at age 40. So potentially, and this is one of the reasons why it's so difficult to talk people into stopping drinking because their brain is still back in their teenage years. Whenever they started drinking, it stopped maturing. It's the way it works. Alcohol can deplete bone density, especially in women who tend to be more susceptible to osteoporosis. Surprisingly, about one third of all older people who drink didn't start until they were older. Asians and Pacific Islanders have the lowest alcohol consumption rate of any of the major racial or ethnic groups in the United States. 4% of the adult population are heavy consumers. Only 4%. Filipino and Japanese Americans are the most likely from this group to drink heavily. Uh, Koreans have the highest number of abstainers. And it's for religious reasons, as weird as that sounds. African Americans have the second lowest percentage of heavy drinkers in their population at 4.2% compared to whites at 7.4%, almost half of what uh, is, is in the white population. Only 40.8% of black males drink monthly compared to 56.5% of white males. Peak drinking seems to occur at the age of about 30. Uh, explanations of high levels of abstention among blacks may be their long history of strong spirituality and matriarchal family structures, and that may be one of the reasons why they don't drink nearly as much. 8.1% of the Hispanic population consume alcohol at a heavy rate. Heavy alcohol use is highest among Mexican Americans, and when we talk about the Hispanic population, we're talking about everybody in South America except for the uh, Brazilians. And we're talking about everybody in Central America and Mexico. Past month uh, use runs at about 46.7%. Binge drinking runs at about 25.8%. 6.2% of Hispanics can be classified as alcohol dependent. American Indian and Alaskan natives have drinking rates that greatly vary by region of the country and tribal affiliations. The heaviest drinking appears to occur among the Northern Plains tribes, especially the Sioux. Of the 10 leading causes of death, five are directly connected to alcohol abuse. Uh, number three, unintentional injuries have to do with alcohol. Number four, diabetes has to do with alcohol. Uh, number six, liver disease and cirrhosis, of course, that has to do with alcohol. Number eight is suicide. Number 10 is homicide. And all these have to do with alcohol. For American Indian Alaska Natives, alcohol-related motor vehicle deaths are 5.5 times higher than the general population. Cirrhosis of the liver is 4.5 times higher. Alcoholism is 3.8 times higher. Homicide 
is 2.8 times higher and suicide is 2.3 times higher for American Indians. So drinking is not the smartest thing in the world to do. It's stereotypical. And that is the end of chapter alcohol, five, I think. All right. <clears throat>